Okay, so let's welcome uh, Johannes Reuter, uh, who was supposed to be with us in Bangalore till the last moment when unfortunately he fell a bit sick. And, uh, but nonetheless, he still agreed to give the talk online and we really appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Johannes. And we look forward to listening more about your recent work on low energy structure of spiral spin liquids. Yeah, thanks a lot, Yasir. And uh, thanks also for giving me this uh, extra slot. Um, yeah, again, it's a bit unfortunate that I cannot be with you, but anyway, I'm very happy to give this talk um, online instead. Yeah, so thanks also to the full team of organizers for um, having me um, uh, with you and for giving me the opportunity to talk about one of my recent favorite uh, projects, I would say, namely about low energy structure of um, spiral spin liquids. So I should also say that this work has been done in very close and actually also very pleasant collaboration with Han Yen from Rice University. So basically in this talk, I am summarizing this recent uh, paper of the both of us. Okay, so what is a spiral spin liquid? So that's uh, basically already the, the key question I would like to address in this talk. And let's start addressing this question with the following statement. A spiral spin liquid occurs when a classical spin model features a continuous set of degenerate incommensurate spin spirals as ground states, which typically form uh, contours or surfaces in momentum space. Now let's give an example for a model where this happens. This is the J1, J2, J3 square lattice Heisenberg model. So we have interactions from first to uh, third neighbor interactions as shown here. If J2 is larger than this ratio and J2 and J3 come in, in this particular ratio. Now, first of all, if J2 is smaller than this value, uh, J1 over four, then depending on the sign of J1, we are either in a trivial ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic phase. However, if we then increase J above this uh, threshold, then in momentum space, these rings occur and each point of this ring stands for the wave vector of um, degenerate um, uh, uh, spin spiral ground states. And then if we increase J2, these rings um, become larger. Now it's actually also well known that uh, this situation also happens on many other systems. Yeah, we already heard talks in this conference by Carlo uh, Penck and by Simon Drapes about various different lattices. Um, historically, one of the first lattices where this situation has been investigated was um, the honeycomb lattice, but there are nowadays um, general ways of constructing these uh, models on a variety of different lattices. And here I refer you to existing literature. Now, actually, for the spiral contour, it, it doesn't make much difference whether your spins are two component XY spins or three component Heisenberg spins. For that reason, actually, in the following, I will make the simplifying assumption of two component XY spins. And then for a single Q spiral state, it simply has this form. So theta here is the spins in plane angle, and theta has this form Q dot. R, or we can reverse it, then Q is the gradient of the spins in plane angle, and we call it the wave factor or the momentum of a spiral. Yeah, so it, it simply means if we go along Q, then the spins rotate in the plane. Or actually, this is also a nice way of illustrating a single Q spiral. So the color at, uh, at each point here in real space denotes where the spin point to. And then a, a spiral manifests in this uh, stripe here fashion here. Uh, here, this arrow is actually the direction of the momentum. It has the direction of a momentum, but it has the length of the of the wavelength. So it goes from red to red here. I will I will use this this kind of illustration uh, a lot uh, throughout this talk. 
Um, actually, we consider the limit of small q, which means that for a spiral spin liquid on the square lattice, we're just slightly above this threshold of, uh, of one quarter, because then the spiral contour becomes a circle. So the length of the momentum is fixed to q naught in the ground state. So this way, we try to avoid um, order by disorder effects. Now let's talk about the order uh, parameter space of the degenerate ground states. It has a spin part and a momentum part. So the spin part for XY spins is SO2, yeah, and it's well known what kind of physics this leads to, uh, namely uh, to costalitz saulus physics and uh, um, vortex anti-vortex um, vortex binding unbinding. Now the momentum part is also SO2. However, that part is actually much, uh, much less studied. And the, the key question I would like to address in this talk, what does this give rise to? Does it also lead to, uh, to costalitz saulus physics? Um, well, we will see in this talk. But one important comment is necessary. So if we have an XY model with SO2 spins, then uh, the SO2 spin degree of freedom comes along with a global spin rotation symmetry. This is actually not the case here for the momentum. It's not associated with a global symmetry. So strictly speaking, you can only rotate the momentum in, in the ground state. Or we can also say that we only have an approximate momentum symmetry at low energies. Just to make sure that we are um, all aware what spin and momentum transformations within the degenerate ground states mean, if we do a global uh, spin rotation of the system, then let's say we change our system from here to here. Yeah, so this is just, just a parallel shift of the stripes. On the other hand, if we do a global um, SO2 rotation of the momentum, then we rotate these stripes as shown here. An important uh, difference of spin and momentum actually also is that the spin length is fixed, but the length of Q can generally vary. However, if we vary Q such that it deviates from Q naught, then we are leaving the ground state manifold. So it costs an energy or in other words, with Q we are in something like um, a Mexican hat uh, potential. Next, let's address the question of, um, of liquidity of a spiral spin liquid. So how can a spiral spin liquid fluctuate through degenerate crown states via thermal or if we allow them also quantum fluctuations? Actually, this is a highly non-trivial question, particularly if you compare our model with, um, with maybe more standard classical frustrated spin systems like the nearest neighbor Heisenberg model on the cargo may lattice. So there we know that uh, ground state is realized whenever for each triangle, this constraint is fulfilled that the three spins on the triangle sum up to zero. And there are extensively many possibilities to uh, fulfill all these constraints. Yeah, one possibility is shown here where the three colors denote the three directions of spins. And then from one configuration, I can always go, go over to another configuration if I swap the colors of, uh, um, of the sides along some path with alternating colors, such as this hexagon, and then we go from here to here. So in other words, different ground states are related to each other by local spin operations, and they are then a natural source for fluctuations. However, Rotating Q in a classical spin liquid is a global operation which transforms almost all spins. I think this becomes quite obvious if you compare this, uh, this picture with this picture. And in the end, this is a consequence of the fact that crown states of spiral spin liquids are only sub-extensively degenerate. Yeah, so their number scales exponentially in the, in the linear uh, dimension in, in this case and not in the volume. So it means that global tunneling between states with different Q will not easily occur. Yeah, so the question really here remains, how can a spiral spin liquid fluctuate through degenerate uh, crown states? Well, the natural guess are vortices. We know vortices from SO2 spins 
There are fluctuations in the spins SO2 degree of freedom give rise to vortices with integer winding numbers. So as examples here, I show three vortices with winding numbers one, minus one, and two. And the question now is, can vortices also occur from the mom momentum degree of freedom, which is, um, which is also SO2? To our surprise, this question has never really been discussed uh, in the literature before. So I will address this question here and also um, investigate um, how momentum vortices can make a spiral spin liquid um, fluctuating. Okay, momentum vortices. Um, to approach these uh, strange objects, let's first of all again highlight the differences between SO2 spin and momentum uh, degree of freedom. As I already mentioned, we only have a soft um, amplitude constraint for the momentum. So in a way with momentum, we are more flexible than, um, than with spins. However, on the other hand, uh, there is an important uh, restricting condition. Yeah, As I mentioned before, the momentum is the gradient of the field of uh, spins in plane angles. And that directly leads to the condition that the momentum is curl free. Yeah, so uh, remember with spins, you can just arbitrarily put spins on a lattice and it will be a valid spin configuration. With momentum, you cannot do that. Yeah, you always have to make sure that this condition here is fulfilled and that has really drastic consequences. So as a result of that, momentum vortices can only exist for n is smaller or equal than one, but not for n equals two, three, and so on. Yeah, this might first of all sound uh, very surprising. Actually in our paper, we came up with a mathematical proof for that. Um, actually, it's a bit lengthy to present mathematical proofs in, in such a talk. So at this point, um, either you believe me or you look it up uh, in, in this paper. But I can try to illustrate the situation. And this can be done by already looking at these examples here. So for n equals 2, you see that the spins always make uh, loops. And that can actually be not avoided. And these loops stand for a finite curl. So therefore, uh, this type of vortex is not allowed, while for n equals 1 and minus 1, there are um, no loops in, in the arrows here. Actually, let me further illustrate momentum vortices. And let's demonstrate the simplest way to construct a momentum vortex. And that is for winding n equals 1. So in that case, the momentum field just points uh, radially inside or outside the, the vortex core. And the real space picture of this momentum vortex is shown here. Again, uh, the color at each point denotes where the spin in the plane points to. Yeah, and here I also show the directions of, um, uh, of the momentum. And you see yeah, it has just the, the winding which you expect from a momentum anti-vortex. It's actually not uh, difficult to calculate its excitation energy in a spiral spin liquid. And you find that it goes like one over R square. So this is pretty much exactly the same as for a usual uh, spin vortex. What's also special about this situation is that it requires no amplitude variations of momentum. And the solution is analytic uh, everywhere except of the vortex core. Um, actually, one can show, and we also have a mathematical proof for that, that this is the only vortex type with uh, this property. Okay, then let's go to n equals minus one anti-vortices. So here we either have to accept uh, amplitude variations, or we have to accept non-analyticities in Q, even outside the vortex core, such as non-continuous Q. It's first of all not so obvious how you would construct a momentum anti vortex with n equals one. The simplest way to do so is actually with a domain wall construction with four domains. And this is shown here. So here we have four domains, and in each domain, 
we are in a state with uh, with a single queue and we put them together uh, at domain wall such that the spins uh, match yeah, so the spin is continuous across a domain wall but the momentum is um, is not continuous it, it jumps yeah, and now from the arrows here you can also see that you have just the right type of winding uh, as you expect for an n equals minus uh, one vortex. However, these sharp domain walls, as they are shown here, they would never occur in this way in a real system. So in a real system upon energy optimization, the domain walls will be slightly rounded uh, as I shown here. But together with the rounding comes uh, amplitude variations in Q. Yeah, you see this here from the arrows. The arrows always go from red to red. So the, uh, the wavelength is longer here along the domain walls, which means that the, the momentum is um, smaller. Yeah, and uh, these, these amplitude variations, they cost an energy. Particularly, uh, this energy cost is there all the way along this infinitely long uh, domain wall, which means that the excitation energy as a function of um, distance from the vortex core doesn't decay at all, it's a constant. Um, yeah, so here we see that we clearly have larger energy costs for anti-vortices than um, for vortices. Also, you realize that with this, uh, with this constant here, if you calculate the, the total energy of a vortex as a function of system size, you, you never get the typical log behavior, which you get in a, in a usual XY magnet. But this log behavior is actually the, the real origin of um, Costa-Litz-Saulus physics. So that means already at this point, we can see that we will never be able to obtain Costa-Litz-Saulus physics from um, momentum vortices. So, and then actually there are also other domain wall configurations for momentum vortices with n equals minus one, for example, as shown here. Uh, so where three domain walls meet, but these domain walls are sharper. So this type of angle alpha here is smaller. So they, they cost more energy. So that means the anti-vortex with um, with the smallest energy are those anti-vortices with four domain walls. So exactly the situation which I showed here. This has actually consequences, this number of four, which is actually quite interesting. So this number of four here is a completely uh, emergent property. Uh, it doesn't occur in the original uh, spin Hamiltonian. And similarly, one can, uh, construct or one can do domain constructions for higher anti-vortices. For example, n equals minus two. This is shown here, but this type of vortex again has a higher energy than um, anti-vortex with n equals minus one. And this way one can do a full classification of domain wall constructions for uh, vortices, which is also shown in our paper. And then I would also like to stress that spin vortices also exist. Yeah? So spin vortices can, for example, exist on top of a constant Q spiral background. This is shown here on the left. So here we have a spin vortex. Yeah, you see this when you draw a circle around it and you go along the circle, you will meet all colors. Or actually a, a spin vortex can also be pinned to a momentum vortex. This is shown here. On the right, so here we have um, a spin vortex and the momentum vortex, both with, with winding numbers n equals one, um, exactly on top of each other. Okay, so far this was basically um, all analytic, but let's see if the things which I discussed so far also occur in actual spin models if we do numeric. So here we performed classical Monte Carlo simulations of a J1, J2, J3, XY model on the square lattice. Yeah, so we have these three uh, interactions as I showed them before. Uh, we are actually able to, uh, to treat quite large system sizes and periodic boundary conditions. 
we choose J1 to be minus one. Yeah? So all the spiral properties emerge out of a ferromagnetic model. Then uh, this is J2, as I discussed before, we are just slightly above this uh, threshold value of one quarter. And then J2 and J3 come in this ratio here. And with this, the spiral wavelength is uh, roughly given by nine lattice constants. Okay, let's start with heat capacity and uh, phase diagram. So this is heat capacity as a function of temperature. And we see two features, a broad hump at larger temperatures and a sharp peak at smaller temperatures. And this is our phase diagram. So first of all here, I will just name the phases. And then on the following slides, I will discuss um, each phase one by one. Yeah, so coming from the high temperature side, we are first in a trivial paramagnet. Then there is a crossover as we cross this broad hump to a so-called pancake uh, liquid. So that means that uh, the spins are already um, correlated, but the length of the momentum is not yet fixed to Q naught. Then as we cross a phase transition T star, we enter into the actual spiral spin liquid phase. So in this phase, the length of the momentum is roughly pinned to, uh, to Q naught and uh, the system fluctuates through high densities of uh, momentum vortices. And then as we lower the temperature further without a phase transition, the system continuously goes into a so-called rigid vortex network phase where um, domain walls become more and more important. Okay, so let's discuss this phase, these phases uh, coming from the high temperature side. So there is not much to say about the paramagnet. Uh, spins are uncorrelated. And again, the color at each point denotes where the spin uh, points to in, in spin space. So then let's cross the broad hump and let's go into the pancake liquid. So as you can see here, in a way, the spins are already correlated, but uh, there is no locking of the length of momentum to Q naught. Now that can also be seen uh, if we plot the spin structure factor in, um, in momentum space. So uh, the, uh, the signal here fills a whole region and the black ring here is actually the, the spiral ring with the radius of, um, of Q naught. So uh, the, the name pancake liquid actually comes from this paper where a very similar model on a honeycomb lattice has been studied because uh, this signal might uh, look like a, uh, a pancake. Okay, and then let's further lower the temperature. Let's cross the phase transition T star and let's go into the actual spiral spin liquid phase. So here now you see that in the real space picture, there are clear um, stripes. So clear well-defined um, spin spirals form on short um, length scales. And the, the momentum is approximately locked to Q naught. Yeah, this can be seen here. The signal is roughly along the black ring and the signal is more or less evenly distributed along the ring. So that means the direction of the momentum um, varies a lot here. And these fluctuations of the direction of Q, that actually also leads to, uh, um, to these momentum vortices, which we see here. Yeah, so if you look at this picture, we have a momentum vortex here, and here is one, and here is one. So these are all vortices with n equals minus one, uh, sorry, with n equals one. And then these X-shaped features like this here, this is an anti-vortex, here we have another anti-vortex and so on. And it's also characteristic that uh, in the spiral spin liquid, they have a, a high density. And this is probably the best uh, picture you can have in mind for a spiral spin liquid. So the system widely fluctuates through uh, these um, momentum uh, configurations. Actually, let's uh, stay for a moment at the same temperature, at the same um, Monte Carlo uh, snapshot. We can also plot the state in a different way, as shown here, not showing the, the direction of the spins, but the local direction of the momentum. 
which is color encoded uh, in, in this picture here. And here we start that uh, we, we see that domains uh, start forming that will become um, stronger uh, as we lower the temperature. We can also plot the momentum amplitude, but so far we cannot yet see too much uh, in there, but that will change in a moment as we uh, further lower the temperature. And as we do so, we uh, smoothly transition into a phase where we see very regular spin patterns emerging uh, as shown here. Here now the momentum um, vortices have a much lower density. Yeah, here we have a vortex, here we have a vortex, here we have an anti-vortex, another anti-vortex uh, and so on. And we actually also see uh, spin vortices present. Yeah, here is a spin vortex uh, encircled in black. Here is another spin vortex. But actually we never see uh, that they uh, bind into, uh, um, into pairs. So from that, we actually have no indication that there is costalitz saulus physics um, in the spins. So no costalitz saulus physics in momentum and um, in spins. What we also see from this pattern is that, that, that there is a rigid and very straight network of, um, of domain walls, which go through the entire lattice. And particularly uh, the vortices are always formed with four domain walls. Yeah, this is a property which I, uh, which I discussed uh, previously. And as a result of that in the spin structure factor, there are always four spots along uh, the, uh, the black ring here with, um, with large signal. Now let's stay at the same temperature and the same spin configuration can now also be discussed by plotting the momentum direction. This is shown here. And yeah, now here the domains are really uh, clearly um, color encoded. And here on the right, I plot the momentum amplitude. And here we also clearly see that domain walls have a, a reduced momentum as I discussed before. Yeah, so this is the, the blue color here. And we can also have a look at the energy of this uh, configuration. And then we also see the domain walls in, in the energy. And what we also see is, as I discussed it before, um, momentum anti-vortices have a larger excitation energy than, um, than the momentum vortex with n equals one. But by far the largest excitation energy is given by spin vortices. Yeah, we see one here and one here. So they have a high energy, which is confined to a small area. So in a way, momentum vortices and spin vortices, they, they live on, on different energy scales. So coming towards the end of the talk, I would like to discuss the nature of the phase transition at T star. We did uh, a bunch of numerical checks, but we never uh, found any symmetry breaking across TC. So the only thing that happens is that the length of Q gets locked roughly at, um, at Q naught. And thinking about it, it's actually not so surprising that uh, we didn't find any symmetry breaking across um, uh, T star, because we actually think that there is a close similarity to the phase transition of liquid water uh, and gas where likewise the density gets locked at rho water without any symmetry breaking. Yeah, liquid water and gas have, um, have the same symmetries. So in that sense, the, the term liquid in, in the spiral spin liquid might actually be really justified because there is a direct analogy to, um, to liquid water. However, admittedly, just on the, on the data we have collected so far, we are not yet able to really decide if it's a, a first or second order um, phase transition um, future will probably tell us. And then uh, during the last few minutes, I would like to uh, very briefly discuss um, another very interesting property of spiral spin liquids, namely a connection to fracton rank two U1 theories. So first of all, a rank two U1 theory is a theory that is subject to a general, generalized type of Gauss law as shown here. 
Uh, if we compare it to the usual Gauss law of a, of a usual U1 gauge theory, then we see it has one more derivative and the electric field is not a vector, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a matrix here. It has two indices. And uh, it's well known that this type of theory hosts a quasi particle, which is called fracton. And the interesting property of fractons is that it's, it's generally immobile. It, can, it cannot move uh, through the system. Yeah, so rho here on the right-hand side is the fracton density. Now, what does all this have to do with a spiral spin liquid? Actually, one can directly make, um, make a connection to this generalized Gauss law if we realize that in our case, the electric field matrix is given by this here. Yeah, this is basically the spatial derivative of the momentum and then epsilon are some anti-symmetric two-dimensional um, epsilon uh, tensors. However, one can also analytically show that by construction uh, or by the very nature of the uh, momentum field, the uh, uh, fracton density must always be uh, zero. Yeah? So we cannot have isolated fractons in our uh, spiral spin liquid. So in the end, that means that the low energy fluctuations of a spiral spin liquid are exactly those of a charge-free electrostatic rank two U1 theory. And also the momentum vortices, let's say with N equals one, have an analog in, uh, in a fracton phase. It corresponds to, um, to, uh, to a um, closely bound quadrupole of fractons. And that is actually um, mobile. Now, this fracton uh, uh, rank two U1 theories, they also have, um, uh, have a certain hallmark in, in the electric field correlation function as shown here, namely in the form of fourfold pinch points. Yeah, in the ideal case, fourfold pinch points have this form here as um, illustrated here. And this is a quantity which we can also calculate in um, Monte Carlo. And we indeed uh, see these four, fourfold pinch points. Yeah, so this again also numerically establishes the connection to uh, uh, fracton physics here. Okay, and with this, I come to the end. So I hope I could convince you that um, spiral spin liquids host a lot of interesting physics such as a previously unexplored type of momentum vortex. Um, but due to this additional curl-free constraint, only winding numbers n equals one, minus one, minus two, minus three, um, and so on are allowed, but not two, three, four, and so on. I also demonstrated to you how an entire vortex can be uh, uh, formed with domain walls. We never see any indications um, for costalitz saulus physics, and I, I also told you the reason why for momentum vortices, but also in, in the spin degree of freedom, we never see any costalitz saulus physics. Numerics shows that uh, a spiral spin liquid occurs below a critical temperature T star, and in these spiral spin liquids, the system fluctuates through spiral states with high vortex density. However, there is no symmetry breaking um, across T star. And then as we go to the lowest temperatures, um, a rigid network of domain walls occurs. And then I also described this very interesting connection between a spiral spin liquid and the charge free rank two U1 theory. Okay, that now brings me to the end. And I thank you for the for your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions. Yeah, let's thank you, Hannes, for a very nice talk. And uh, questions? Uh, very nice talk. I'm very curious about quantum fluctuations on top of this yeah. classical liquid. <clears throat> What's your comment? Okay, yeah, that, that's of course a very uh, good, but also a very um, uh, difficult questions. So um, 
originally I planned this talk uh, not not saying anything about FRG, but now that that you ask me about quantum fluctuations, I will still say something about um, functional renormalization. So we we applied functional renormalization to uh, um, to many uh, of these um, spiral spin liquid models, and the typical observation is that um, once you enter this uh, this classical spiral spin liquid phase the the magnetic order is is gone so quantum fluctuations destroy magnetic order so one might conjecture that um, spiral spin liquids are are a good starting point to uh, um, to get to get quantum spin liquids as we switch on um, quantum fluctuations but but okay uh, there are other candidates like um, valence bond solid and make, making a general statement is, is very difficult. And of course, ideally, we would also want to, uh, um, to see uh, what happens with momentum vortices as we switch on quantum fluctuations. But um, we, we are working on this, but we are not yet so far to, uh, to really give um, a final conclusion. Because the momentum vertices and quantum fluctuations are really relevant in charge dense wave systems, not spin dense, where ah, okay. charge dense is very soft yeah. and there are very yeah. interesting physical systems also. Yeah, yeah, yeah okay. That, that, of course, opens another uh, very interesting um, uh, direction. Here, here we only considered um, spin, uh, spin systems. Okay, I have a, another question. So in your simulations, um, am I correct to assume that if you would go to really, really low temperatures, you would still get a phase transition to one of the single spiral states? Oh, um, also very good question. Actually, for a, for a perfect spiral spin liquid, uh, so imagine the, the, the momentum surface is, is very, very small. Um, so in that ideal case, you would have... Um, you would have a, a perfect momentum um, rotation. Sure, but you have led this. You have led this simulation. So then, then in principle, at you know a minuscule temperature, you would assume that you have a single stripe phase that breaks. Right. Everything. Yeah. So, so, so if if you take into account uh, the lattice effect, then um, then eventually it, it may happen that you run in um, in uh, into a into an ordered phase. But if you ignore these these effects, um, then you have you have an exact momentum symmetry, and then Mermin Wagner would would prevent this. Um, yeah, so only the underlying lattice could, in the end, uh, trigger a single Q state. But this is actually some type of physics which which we wanted to exclude here. Yeah, so yeah. we went as as close as possible to the limit um, where your spiral ring is is very small. Mm -hmm. Okay, I understand. And, and then connected to the previous question, so um, quantum fluctuation, I mean, then how does that tie in with an order by disorder? Because there, I guess people have shown that quantum fluctuation would select also single Qs or the spiral states which break the lattice symmetry. So are you saying that if you put S1 half, they would always be unstable, these ordered states, or...? Um, well, I mean, th this, is, uh, this is our... Uh, our observation so far, but I, I think I cannot make a, a statement what what will happen in the in the general case. Um, when people talk about order by disorder, then typically three three dimensional models um, are are considered uh, where you can have a finite um, phase transition um, uh, already in the classical model. Okay, thank you. So when we change the uh, parameters in the co spin, configuration, spin configuration space, so the spin vortices will move. Uh, so what will happen when the spin vortices will merge with the momentum vortices? Um, so wait, what, what exactly do you uh, want to do? You want to change the... Uh... Yeah, yeah, in this diagram. No, no, uh, this one. So the, uh, when we change the parameters in the spin configuration, uh, will the spin vortices will move? Um, so you mean ch changing these these parameters here? Yeah, yeah. Um, so so you you want to change the the coupling parameters while 
while doing the the simulation i am not not quite sure i understand the question uh, actually in the uh, phase diagram where the we plotted the spin uh, vortices this phase diagram no no no, no. Uh, uh, maybe i actually my question is incorrect i think uh, Are there any further questions or comments uh, also from the online speakers, uh, the online participants? If so, you can unmute yourself and ask. Oh yeah, uh, Nils has a question for you, Johannes. Um, so actually, I just got curious. Uh, I, I realized that many papers where they where they mention these uh, emergent gauge theories, uh, they relate this. Um, also, this uh, correlation function of the emergent gauge field and the the, emerg the pinch points, and they they say okay because we have a we have a, um, a feature in this correlation function we will also have a feature in the spin correlation function, but actually this seems to be a um, a counter example to that right because I didn't see any fourfold pinch point in your momentum uh, uh, in in your momentum uh, correlation function. Uh, um so the the pinch points do not occur in um in the actual um spin structure factor but what you have to do is let's go back to the relevant quest, uh, to the relevant slide you have to to take the derivative of of q and then that gives you the electric field and then you you calculate the correlation function of of that electric field so not not of the spin. Uh, okay, but, but what I mean is you could also plot the Q correlation function, right? Somehow. So not not the spin order, but the, the Q. So so you usually plot them side by side, right? Ah. The, yeah. Yeah. Um, I can also plot that, but I think that is uh, that is pretty uh, pretty featureless. So um, it, it just 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 decays um, in uh, in momentum space. Yeah, so so it will not have these these pinch points certainly. Okay, interesting. So it seems like maybe this argument of relating this emergent gauge field to the uh, correlation function to the underlying uh, field is not not necessarily always correct, right? Well, well, I mean. Uh, uh, um, here, here the construction turns out to be such that that you need this particular quantity of electric field electric fields correlator to um, to uh, uh, to get this uh, this property, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks. That answers my question. Okay. So then let's thank Johannes again and thank you, Johannes. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.